Yeah. Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we are bringing an alternative to conventional training and philosophy. And today, we are going to dig a little deeper into drives, the drives of the dog, and kind of my thoughts and philosophy on them. And I would love to hear you guys' input and thoughts back in return. But before we get into that, uh, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Canine Academy Online. So Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy. We have local training in the central Florida and, uh, and in northern North Carolina, just on the Virginia border. And um, we also have online training where we focus on obedience, service dog training, tracking, protection work, and tactical training. You can contact us on our website at Fort, I'm sorry, it's not Fortress K9, it is K9AcademyOnline.com. And that is the letter K, the number nine, AcademyOnline.com. You can also email me at joel at k9academyonline.com. You can send me a text message if you have questions at 813-836-9244. And you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube by searching for K9 Academy Online. Don't forget, you can also find out information about our puppies and get on a waiting list for one of our dogs by going to Fortress K9 dot puppies on Instagram or just searching for Fortress K9 puppies on Facebook. All right, now that we have our housekeeping taken care of, <clears throat> let's get a little uh, let's get into our topic for today, which is diving a little deeper into drives, the dog's drives. So, uh, I have mentioned this before on a previous episode. I can't remember which one now, but it, we basically, I just kind of mentioned it and I said, um, you know, I understand that drives are an attempt by a lot of people to explain the behaviors that they are seeing in the dogs, but I have never really liked the drives and for a while I really struggled to be able to explain why I didn't like the drives. And I, I still believe that um, they break down at, at quite a few levels, which is one of the things that I, I didn't really like about them in the first place. Um, I do think that they try to explain every little thing that the dog does based on drives, and I think that that's a fallacy of thought process. But as I was working through the topics for the last couple of episodes, um, it they kind of hit me that one of the things and probably the primary thing that upsets me or, or does it, it's incoherent. I don't really get upset about it. I could care less if people think dogs have drives, but it's incoherent. And the primary thing that I've realized is it's a desire to oversimplify a complex creature. And, uh, and so in people's desires to kind of boil the, the dog down into simple, understandable chunks, they have created this idea of these various drives that the dog has. And then they try to use those drives and that the idea that they you know, function primarily off of these drives to, to train the dogs to do various different things, right? And I'm not saying that the drives mentality and philosophy is totally unwarranted. Uh, I'm not saying that it doesn't have some place in terms of helping people to understand some of the actions and reactions that the dogs have. I just think there are much better ways of explaining it and much better ways of understanding it 
and I think if you're trying to really dig into the nuances of the dog that drives sells the dog way short and if you're not familiar uh, with what I'm, I'm referring to by drives and, and I'm probably oversimplifying the overall concept here um, but for the sake of time essentially it's the concept that um, the dog you know functions mostly in its kind of animalistic primal state of seeking certain things that it wants and so that could be uh, a toy or a tug it could be food it could be uh, prey you know chasing something and um, and then they'll have you know, they'll use other descriptions of drives like defense drive. They typically refer to that as a negative drive, um, different things like that. And, and they use these things to try and explain why the dogs do certain things. And they try to use them to their benefit when they're trying to train the dog. So, uh, you know, if you've heard our other podcasts, you know that I do not primarily use food or treats or toys to get the dog to do anything. We don't use treats or food for any kind of obedience. Um, the only time we use it in our training at all is when we're teaching the dogs uh, that they have to obey uh, even when we're taking the food away from them uh, or even when we're messing with the food when they're eating, they have to leave it alone. They have to not mess with the people or the other dogs when they come in and mess with their food. So we use it to stabilize the dogs. We don't use it in any of our training methods. There are a few things that we do with the dogs where we may use um, a, a ball or a PVC pipe or things like that and let the dogs play with them while we are doing um, uh, like scent work and things of that nature, right? But we are functioning fundamentally off of something that goes a lot deeper than this animalistic kind of primal drive. Now, I'm not saying that the dogs are not animals. They are. Um, animals do not have the level of cognitive reasoning that human beings do. Uh, nowhere close. But if you heard my last episode, we talked about the one thing that the dog has it's unique and different from every other creature in nature and that is that the dog bonds to mankind and so when we take this aspect of the dog into consideration as we're viewing how we train the dog how we understand the dog then there's a couple of things that emerge in that kind of exploration of why the dogs act and do the things that they do. And one of those things is either the dog is willing to forego its most primal instincts of food uh, or sex drive, which they will often throw uh, getting pet into that drive, or um, a toy of some kind or tug or chasing an animal. They will overcome those desires for their bond with the human. Okay, so that's one way of, of looking at it, of, of perceiving what they're doing. Or, if that's not accurate, then the other alternative is the desire to be bonded to the human is their most primal instinct, even greater than food and all of that sort of stuff. Okay, now, um, I tend toward thinking that it's the first. Uh, I, I believe that the dog is unique in its quality to bond with human beings. And I think that based on my almost 20 years of dog training and the way that I've witnessed working the dogs through different things, 90% of the things that we do with the dogs revolves around their bond to their handler and that being the driving factor in their performance, right? So I, I use um, commands, praise, and correction as our basic handling technique. But when we keep the dogs at a distance, we can get them to do quite a few things using those techniques. But when we bond that dog to their person, when they're going to a new family, 
or when we decide that that dog is staying with us as part of our breeding program and becomes one of our dogs and we let it bond a lot closer to us, all of a sudden they have a much higher degree of performance for the people they're bonded to. So even though they will work at a decent level uh, for people that they're not bonded to based on the training techniques that we use, when we combine those techniques with the bond with the handler, the level of performance of the dog drastically increases. And I believe that this is due to the fact that the bond is the primary motivating factor in the dog. Um, now again, you know, maybe somebody's gonna come up with bond to drive now or something, who knows. But I don't believe the drive mentality either explains this or takes it into consideration in their training, right? When I listen to the other trainers kind of explain their philosophies and things like that, you know, they'll say, you know, the dogs are basically just uh, self-serving creatures. They follow, you know, their desires. Uh, so we have to use those desires and we basically give them more of what they desire if they're obedient. And that is a lot of trainers out there, that's their mentality in using the food uh, and or the tugs and toys. Whereas I go, um, I believe that the primary motivating factor of the dog at its deepest level is knowing that their handler is pleased with them, especially if they have a bond to that handler. Now, if the dog doesn't have any bond to you at all, they probably don't care what you think, but the more you spend time with the dog, the more that that dog sees um, their handler as their person, the, the person that they bond themselves to, then the more they will do for that person based on that bond. And so I think we have to be really careful in oversimplifying the, uh, the desires and the willingness of the dog to work using these drives. Now, the, a couple of other things that really um, break down with these drives when you start getting into it is the drives don't take into consideration stress inoculation and the stress of the dog. So when they do stress type exercises, um, and, and the exercises that, they, that I've seen are a level of stress training, they're a level of stress inoculation, but it's at such a basic level of stress that it's a good start for a young dog, but to pretend that that is a, you know, like a finishing drill on a dog is kind of ridiculous. Um, so a lot of the stress that they will do is they will have uh, like pom-poms, um, on, usually on the end of like the glittery sticks, you know, the, the metallic reflective pom-pom type things that, that kind of make a rattly crackly noise. Uh, they'll use uh, two liter bottles with like dried beans in them so they make a, you know, like a you know, real racket uh, when you shake them around. I've seen them uh, use various different things like this to create things that the dog doesn't really understand in the beginning. And so in the beginning, a lot of dogs will back away from them because they don't understand whether or not these things can be harmful or not to them. And then after they get used to them, they're like, oh yeah, that thing doesn't do anything to me, so why do I care, right? And, and so these things are often touted as, wow, look how awesome my dog's doing. It is, you know, it's still doing this bite work while I'm rattling this stuff all around it, right? And uh, another way that they will deal with stress and the desires of the dog to back out of the, the fights that they do uh, when they're doing like these deep mouth bites and they're just wanting the dogs to hold on is they'll pet them and things like that while they're biting as their way of letting the dog know that it's okay and they're basically reducing the stress that the dog is having to deal with, right? The petting and all that sort of stuff, it reduces the stress and they don't actually fight with the dog. So the, the problem with that is rather than teaching the dog to deal with stress, they reduce the stress of the situation to something that the dog can't deal with. So let me say that again so you can kind of wrap your mind around it. Rather than teaching the dog to deal with an elevated level of stress, they 
reduce the level of stress in the exercise to something the dog can deal with. Now think about that for a minute. When you're doing a sport or you're doing something along those lines, those sorts of things can work just fine, right? And so if that's what you're training for, um, that methodology can be effective and that's great. If that's what you're training for, you know, uh, teach the dogs to do what they need to do so that you can score as high as possible um, and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with going and enjoying sports with your dogs, um, whether that's the, the Schutzen, you know, KMPB protection type sports uh, or rather, whether it's uh, agility and things of that nature, right? But what we do is we train the dogs, number one, for us to have control in the agility. Right? So a lot of dogs that come to us that have done agility trials in the past and things like that, they, they see the exercise, they watch another dog in front of them run through it and they just want to race through it. So they are willing to deal with the level of stress to go into whatever the agility obstacle is and do the obstacle, but they don't want to do it at the pace that the handler sets. Right, And so a lot of times running these dogs through as fast as you can, while that's fun for a competition, and you know, we even do it when we do our challenge courses is we're working the dogs through multiple stress exercises one after the other um, as fast as we can. There's a time and a place for that, it can be beneficial, but when we get to our control drills and our control exercises, we should at any point along the lines be able to either slow the dog's pace or stop the dog completely or call the dog out of the exercises and back to our side um, through all of those things, right? And when we're dealing with a dog that's being trained for protection work, that scenario, that situation where that person's life is literally hanging in the balance and the dog is the thing that is supposed to be the, the assistant to help end that threat, right? Because you should never rely 100% on a dog. Um, you should always have you know, your own backup, your own self-protection and all that kind of stuff. But the dog is a massive force multiplier. and in the event that you actually need that, the person who is attacking you is not going to lower the stress to a level that the dog can handle, right? They are going to bring a very high level of stress, a very high level of aggression, a very high level of intensity to that situation, and you and the dog together as a team must be able to deal with that confrontation deal with that level of stress and prevail anyway, right? So when we get back to these, this drive mentality of prey versus defense, for example, and, uh, and I, I, again, think that those things seek to way oversimplify what's happening. But when you get back to those ideas, the question becomes, are we training our dogs to function in a game? or are we training our dogs to function under an actual threat, right? And um, so the only way you can train a dog to function under an actual threat is to actually be a threat to the dog. And if the dog doesn't see you as a threat, then it's going to react in some other way than defending from a threat. And so, for instance, one of the places that we see this is um, I'm bringing up an intern right now in protection work and training and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he's a young kid. He just turned 18. And he has not yet learned how to actually become aggressive and be a threat to the dogs. And so they will, they'll bite him and they'll kind of do the stuff that they're supposed to do when he's in the suit. But you can tell their level of intensity is way down because they understand he's not a threat. Right? Now some people would look at that and be like, oh, see, your dogs are weak and pathetic because they don't uh, bite hard even when the person isn't doing, you know, uh, being very threatening and aggressive. And that is one way you can look at it. And that's, um, you know, if that's your perspective on it, then, um, you know, then you, you do the training and the things that work for you. But another way of looking at that perspective, and this is how we've always brought our dogs into the work, is that the dogs will bring the level of fight to the situation that the threat brings to the situation. So this is one of the reasons we don't do things like the bark and hold, right? Because we don't need to do the bark and hold. 
if the person is not a threat, then our dogs have a very low level of aggression. If the person is a moderate threat, then our dogs bring a moderate level of aggression to the field or to the situation. If the person is a very high threat, then our dogs ramp the level of intensity and aggression up substantially and they always are reacting to the level of threat that's there and increasing their intensity to whatever level they need to to overcome that level of threat. So for instance, if I'm fighting with a dog and they, they need their intensity ramped up, while they're biting me, I will go attack their handler, right? Or if they're not fully engaging with me, I'll go attack their handler. And as soon as I attack their handler, their level of intensity will double or triple, right? And all of that has to be built into the dog over time so that they get more and more and more aggressive during those situations. But that is how we have always trained our dogs. And when I look at the situation, I go, I don't want a dog just totally smashing someone who is a fairly low level threat, right? So somebody who maybe they attack us, they were hiding, they see us come, they attack us, they don't realize we have a dog with us, right? And as soon as the dog engages, they are kind of like a holy crap, you know, shit their pants. I want out of this situation. I thought this was gonna be easy. So there's still a bad guy. There's still a threat. There's still somebody who, you know, we have every right to defend ourselves against, but there's somebody who didn't want a very high level of risk. They weren't willing to accept a very high level of risk. So they jump out, they attack. All of a sudden there's a dog that they didn't expect. The dog starts to bite them. They realize, crap, I want out of here. And they want to flee. I don't want my dog to permanently injure that guy as he's trying to run away, right? One of the things we teach our handlers is to always leave an escape for the bad guy and to let them have it if they want it, okay? And why do we do that? So when I train my handlers to use their dogs in self-defense situations, it's very important to me that they bring to the situation the mentality that the purpose of the dog is not to cause harm. The purpose of the dog is to preserve life. And this is an important concept to bring to your self-defense because a lot of people, and I see this in the tactical firearms world, I see it in a lot of your um, your you know tactical fighting type worlds, the MMA, the Krav Maga, all these kinds of things. A lot of these places bring this mentality of cause maximum damage, right? And there's a time and a place, and in, in, in I'm not saying that that doesn't have any application in self-defense, but if that's how we think about the dogs, then we set ourselves and the dogs up for failure after the situation is over, right? And a lot of people are very short-sighted in what they do when they're prepping for this. And this was actually one of the things that came up in a lot of the Facebook drama that was recently going on on my page was a guy was talking about the risks of lawsuits and things of that nature. And, um, you know, Facebook is not a very good medium for uh, debate or explanation. So I just let most of the comments go. But um, it would be something worth doing a video on to let people see. And it's something worth discussing here is the purpose of the dog is to end the threat and preserve life, not to create more damage, right? So the guy was telling me the way that our dogs bite, they're gonna create a lot more damage, which is true, than a dog who is um, biting and holding, which is true, and we've talked about this before in the uh, bite and hold, the, the natural bite versus the deep mouth bite or the full mouth bite. Um, so if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to that. But the way that our dogs bite does cause a lot more damage to the person. But the reason we train our dogs to bite in a way that causes more damage is because in a high threat situation, especially a threat situation where somebody has most likely seen your dog, they've most likely observed the level of obedience and the level of discipline in that dog, then if they approached you, they were warned not to come near or they were going to be bit. and then they still continued the attack, right? 
in that situation, this person has a very high level of willingness to create a heavy amount of damage to you. They're at a very high level risk to you as the person if you have a dog and they've continued through all these steps until the point where they're actually attacking you, okay? So if you find yourself in that situation where this person has been willing to attack you even though they've received all these warnings, then that level of threat is much more elevated and I want to end it much more quickly, right? And the only way to end a threat quickly when someone's already willing to engage with all the other warnings that they've received is to inflict maximum damage in a minimum amount of time, but with complete control by the handler. So what I mean by that is the person attacks and the dog creates as much damage as possible very quickly so that the person doesn't want to fight and engage any longer. They want it to end. They want the dog to stop damaging them. And then the moment they are willing to stop the fight, the dog is called off. And our handlers are trained in a few um, the videos that we have our audio on. We hear our handlers saying, stop fighting the dog and I'll call him off. Stop fighting the dog and I'll call him off. Out. Right? And when they tell the dogs out, the dogs are to out. And, um, you know, our Finnish dogs out very well. Our young dogs are still learning the out commands. Um, there are various different levels of that. But a lot of our dogs start to condition themselves that when they hear you telling the person, stop fighting the dog, stop fighting the dog, if the person stops fighting, the dog begins reducing the level of fight that they're bringing to the person right off the bat, right? Because they recognize, okay, I'm getting ready to get called off. This person's willing to stop fighting now. And, um, and then in our training, sometimes we ramp it back up and they have to, to increase the amount of fight again because the person's still willing to engage. Or sometimes the person actually stops fighting and you call them off, right? So, but this is why we get into this with our dogs. So let's bring this back around to what we're talking about. So the reason I brought all of that up is real life situations, real life training, when you're prepping to deal with real life situations, these situations are complex. They are not simple. They're not, um, you know, one size fits all. It's not always going to happen the same way. And a lot of the tactical training methods, a lot of the dog training, a lot of the fighting, um, you know, the hand-to-hand -hand training that people are doing tries to boil these situations down into the step one, step two, step three scenarios where, well, this is how it's going to happen, right? And whenever they start trying to simplify things down to these lowest levels, things begin to break down very quickly. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place for basics, there is, but when we start talking about the higher levels of training, we have to learn, number one, to deal with stress so that we can function under stress, and number two, we have to learn to operate and problem solve in that dynamic environment, which is constantly changing, which is always shifting to something new, because we need to recognize, hey, this isn't working, I need to change, but we also have to recognize that the person we're fighting with who is attacking us, if they've done this frequently, they probably also have an ability to function under a fairly high level of stress. So if they realize they're being countered, they may also counter our counter and on and on it goes. And it becomes a game of countering each other's counters, right? So having the dog is a counter that most people have not prepared for, right? But when you look at certain situations, I was talking with a guy who, um, he's a black guy, lives in a black community, and he said in the area that he lives in, um, a number of years ago, there were a lot of stray dogs that would attack people in their neighborhood. And so a lot of these guys started learning to wrap their wrap an arm and when the dogs would come and bite them they would stab the dogs and they would kill them and um and so that's a, that's protecting themselves against dogs that are just you know nuisance dogs um and so i totally appreciate why they're doing what they're doing but in that environment you also have to recognize that now your dogs that are acting in the way that those dogs were acting 
and are willing to just come in and take a bite that's being given to them are setting themselves up to be killed by the same guys who had to defend themselves against dogs who were attacking them. Right, so if some of those guys in that environment were guys that were gonna cause problems, they've now trained for one of those scenarios that most other people haven't, right? So you never know what people have trained for. And a lot of the guys who are predators have been in and out of prison. Um, a lot of the guys in prisons will train with one another to either overcome uh, standard arrest tactics and procedures or to overcome standard defensive tactics that people will use to protect themselves, right? And so we come back around to oversimplifying complex situations. And we need to stop oversimplifying complex situations. We need to understand and embrace that things are complicated. Things are oftentimes extremely complicated. So complicated we can't possibly even begin to, to comprehend and fathom all of the nuances that there are. Right, and so then the best thing we can do at that point when we recognize how complicated things are in real life is we start going, okay, well at the very least I need to be able to think and reason through these complex situations. So I need to train myself to be able to do that, think and reason, under stress, right? So let's come back around to the drives with the dogs. Embracing complexity, embracing complexity. The dogs are a complex creature. They bond with human beings in a way that no other animal does. And because they bond with human beings, you can't simply boil down all of their behaviors to a couple of drives, right? Now, what has happened is they just keep creating new drives for each new little thing. And ultimately, what they end up with in the long run as that continues on for you know decades is it's just as complicated as it was before and they'll come up with some other type of thing to start describing uh, the dogs that attempts to simplify and boil things down again, right? But as you see more and more and more drives pop up on the spectrum, you realize these, these drives aren't doing a very good job at their explanation because the whole purpose of the drive was to simplify things. Well, things aren't always simple. There are certain things that the dogs do in a pattern type driven uh, process and dogs are very pattern driven. So we can use the fact that dogs are pattern driven to deal with certain situations and to train them to do certain things. <coughs> Excuse me. But we need to recognize that when we get into the high stress situations, the tactical situations, the self defense situations, the dynamic movement situations, those are the times when the dog has to be able to comprehend, reason, and process information. And the only reason they stay with us in those ultra high stress environments is because they are bonded to us. And that bond can be strengthened and that bond can be weakened based on how we interact with the dogs. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. I hope that it helps you have a broader perspective and understanding of the dog and how it operates. Uh, we got off on a few tangents. I try not to get off on tangents too much uh, on these topics uh, so that we can kind of keep on topic as we go. Um, so I apologize if I got too far off topic on that. Um, I still do need to do a, uh, an episode on specifically how we approach um, defensive situations with the dogs to minimize our exposure to lawsuits and maximize our ability to defend ourselves in uh, these high stress situations. So um, I'd love to hear your questions. I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, remember, you can contact me at joel at fortresscanine.com. Don't forget to visit our websites, fortresscanine.com and canineacademyonline.com. And if you don't already follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and or YouTube, you can search for Fortress Canine or Canine Academy online on any of those platforms. And you can also search for Fortress Canine Puppies on Facebook and Instagram to see our pups there that are available for sale. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful. And until next time, remember to train hard and stay safe. Canine Podcast.